Please welcome to the stage Jody Ginsberg from Committee to Protect Journalists. How do you gauge the health of a democracy? I'd suggest one easy way is to look at the way it treats its media. The test of any strong democracy is whether its leaders and its officials, its people and its systems not only tolerate, but encourage a free and independent press. The treatment of journalists, of editors, of newsrooms and media owners is a leading indicator for the way in which those in power treat the rest of society. It is a fundamental freedom and basic human right on which all others depend, so many of the pledges and issues that we're hearing about today. And that's why all of us in this room today should be deeply concerned, because the environment for journalists and news outlets has deteriorated sharply in the past decade. My organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists, an international press freedom nonprofit, that works to keep journalists safe worldwide has never before experienced the breadth and depth of the attacks that we see currently against the media. And we have been doing this work for more than four decades. These issues are no longer confined to authoritarian regimes. Over the past three years, record numbers of journalists have been imprisoned, wrongfully detained on spurious charges that range from accusations of terrorism and sedition to money laundering and tax evasion, charges that this morning's panelists, Maria Ressa, Al Sukhomasheva, and even the BBC know all too well. Harassment on social media is commonplace, including here in the United States, with women and those from marginalized communities disproportionately targeted. Physical threats are also on the rise. Last year was the deadliest period for journalists in seven years. More journalists were killed in Gaza in the last 10 weeks of 2023 than have ever been killed in a single country in an entire year. All but five of the 113 killed in the past 11 months were Palestinians. But it is not only in war zones that journalists are at risk. The nexus of organized crime and political corruption in Mexico has made that country the deadliest place for journalists in the world outside a war zone. In Venezuela, rising political violence following the recent fraud election has led to record high numbers of arrests. Venezuela was already seeing a steady flow of persecuted journalists into exile. And this is a trend that we now see in so many parts of this world, journalists fleeing to countries other than their own, from Afghanistan to Myanmar to Sudan. And as you will hear from me later this morning, the crisis of our time, the environmental crisis, will mean that journalists will need the resources to report safely on environmental degradation and climate change, no matter where they are. Protecting journalists has never been more important. And so I'm grateful to the Clinton Global Initiative for having recognized this in its programming this year. And to you in this room for helping us to start reverse this trend. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton and from PBS Firing Line, Margaret Hoover.
Secretary Hello. Clinton, <laughs> thank you for joining me here for what is going to become a special edition of Firing Line on PBS. Uh, and for all of you for joining Secretary Clinton at the Clinton Global Initiative. You often talk about what you call a global debate between autocracy and democracy. Where does freedom of the press fit into that fight? Well, thank you so much, Margaret, and, and thanks to all of you, um, particularly those of you who are in the press, who are here for this and then for the panel that uh, Margaret will do afterwards. I think freedom of the press is like at the top of the list of um, those freedoms, those necessary uh, elements of maintaining democracy against autocracy. And the trends are not good. I mean, the trends are uh, going in the wrong direction with the targeting of journalists, the intimidation of journalists, the use of um, kind of reverse psychology to call what journalists produce fake or disinformation, um, as opposed to the narrative from the, uh, the government, the demagogue, the autocrat. So I think it's uh, not only an incredibly important issue, but really timely because we are not paying enough attention to the threats at a national level and the overall global threat that we face. In the context of your lifetime in public service, has media freedom been in a graver place? Probably not in my lifetime, except of course in countries that were clearly um, dictatorships, whether it was the you know, former Soviet Union or communist China or any other um, country that was uh, intent upon uh, leadership staying in power. But then there was always the contrast. I mean, we in the United States, uh, in much of the West, could point to the freedom of the press as one of the big differences between uh, our way of life, our society, um, our form of government, and what was on the other side. Uh, and we spent a lot of time you know, making the argument as to why freedom of the press was so essential. And I don't think it surprises uh, anybody to hear me say, now we are facing some of the same um, attitudes toward the press, um, weaponizing political opposition to the press uh, that uh, we used to point at and say, no, it, that happens there, but not here. Well, we, um, certainly authoritarian regimes don't pretend to have freedom of the press, but we were even hearing from political candidates for president, at least one of them, um, Donald Trump is often called the press, the enemy of the people. That's exactly right. That's my point, Margaret. You know, I think too many people, frankly, in the press, as well as all the rest of us, don't take these threats as seriously as they should. Um, the campaign that uh, Trump is running, the people who uh, enable him, who are allied with him, people who hold... Uh, positions uh, in government now or will if uh, he were ever to be president again, they uh, at the very least disdain the press because the press will not, in many cases, uh, you know, report what they want uh, to see uh, reported. And so for Trump in particular, but he's not the only one, but obviously he's the, the leading example, uh, to be attacking the press on a regular basis, to be inciting the crowds that come to his rallies to turn on the press that are actually there to cover it, to deny the reality that the press is reporting, and to only go to outlets that are his political allies that are not, in my view, um, acquainted with the idea of objectivity uh, because they are in uh, cahoots uh, with his uh, effort to return to power for whatever reason, financial, ideological, religious, uh, partisan, whatever the reason is. So he's comfortable with press, which is using the term very loosely, uh, that agrees with him and reports only what he wants them to report. And all the rest of the press is illegitimate, uh, enemy of the people, 
hoax, uh, perpetrating hoaxes on us and the rest. Well, you never got any bad press, so you didn't have to call them the enemy of the media. <laughs> um, no, no, I'm not going there. No. <laughs> uh, look, I'd like to ask you about a few topics that are developing right now. In the Middle East, the war between Israel and Hamas continues as tensions are rising between Israel and Hezbollah. Um, this is going to be a major issue in the election in 43 days. And you taught as a professor at Columbia as the war opened up on October 7th last year. You encountered a new generation of students who were not as acquainted with the peace process from your husband's administration or the many efforts uh, that you conducted as Secretary of State. What did that generation or what does that generation need to understand as they consider who to vote for in 43 days? Well, you're right. I mean, I had an incredible experience teaching uh, last year, and October 7th happened early in the semester. I'm teaching again. I've written about it in my new book, uh, Something Lost, uh, Something Gained, because it was striking to me. These are incredibly bright students from all over the world. They're obviously not just Americans. I teach at the School of International uh, and Public Affairs. So I think what struck me the most was a lack of context and uh, a, an absolute either misunderstanding or no understanding of history. Everybody is entitled to their opinion, of course, but in an institution of higher learning in particular, you want there to be some uh, context and historical basis for the opinions that are expressed. And in you know, many encounters uh, with students, uh, they held very strong opinions, often gleaned, honestly, from social media. Um, and the videos that they watched on TikTok and elsewhere had shaped their opinion about a conflict that, uh, for many of them, they were just opening their eyes to for the first time. They yeah. had not paid much attention before. So in conversation with them, if I were to say something, for example, like if Yasser Arafat had accepted the offer that my husband made at Camp David, they would have had a Palestinian state for 24 years, I might hear back, who's Yasser Arafat? Yeah. Or what do you mean? What did your husband do? And that's okay, you know, that was a long time ago before some of them were born or when they were literally toddlers. But then when they would, you know, engage in sloganeering um, or uh, reductionist thinking uh, and, and not paying attention to the complexity, because I said in the very first class after October 7th, look, it was a cl it's a class called Inside the Situation Room, and, it, and it's meant to be about crisis decision making. I said, we have a crisis, obviously. Hamas is a terrorist organization that committed... Uh, a vicious attack on uh, civilians in Israel. Israel has a right to defend itself, and Israel uh, has to abide by the laws of war. Um, and you have to keep those things in your mind at the same time. It's not either or. It is truly both and and. And I was, um, you know, struck by how what started off as kind of questioning uncertainty about what was happening, you know, kind of morphed into a very... Uh, hard uh, position about uh, the conflict without regard, as I say, to either context or history. I, I suspect they didn't know that when you were first lady in 1998, you caused a degree of controversy for calling for a Palestinian state. This is a position that the vice president holds today, who's running for president. Um, your point is well taken, that there is there's modern history and contemporary history that has, has missed a generation. Um, but I'd like to ask you about another story that you tell in Something Lost, Something Gained, and Operation White Scarves. This is your, um, there is a, Elliot Ackerman has coined the individual's efforts to evacuate people from Afghanistan as a digital Dunkirk. And you ran your own operation. Um, women would show up in white scarves at the gates at the airport in Kabul to be evacuated. You successfully evacuated a thousand Afghan women, um, their family members through this private effort, but thousands are still left behind. Um, looking forward, what can the U.S. do now for the Afghan, the women of Afghanistan? You know, Margaret, as I, I write in that chapter, this was truly one of the most 
intense and stressful uh, experiences I've ever had, personally or uh, professionally, working with a dedicated team to raise the money for charter flights, to you know, make the calls I made to the heads of government uh, around the world who would take these uh, uh, women being evacuated and then working with people on the ground to get them to the airport, to get them through the airport. And the white scarves uh, became the uh, sign that the uh, Defense Department suggested I use to try to, you know, identify the women that we were evacuating. So I, I'm very grateful that we got those women and their family members out and many others through other efforts. But what's going on in Afghanistan is, you know, beyond uh, tragic. And the efforts by the Taliban to justify their rule perverting their own religion in order to oppress women um, should be a wake-up call to everybody. Um, I think the term gender apartheid applies. Uh, we are working uh, with a group of uh, lawyers and advocates uh, from Afghanistan, from Iran and elsewhere who are trying to you know, make sure that that concept, which really is uh, in line with racial apartheid, uh, be understood as a uh, description of what's going on. And now the latest, um, the latest efforts uh, to suppress women, uh, asking, or not asking, ordering them uh, not to speak in public, their voices can't be heard, uh, they have to be, you know, not just covered, but like literally uh, burqa uh, with scarves on top, um, so nobody can even uh, hear their voice, uh, is a... Um, extreme example of the pushback on women's rights that's going on elsewhere in the world. There are many uh, places uh, where women's rights are being eroded. And, and I want to add just one other point to this. It's very difficult for the United States government to know what to do. Um, I was first lady at the end of the 90s when the Taliban came into office the first time, and the Taliban uh, was trying to ingratiate itself uh, in order to get the seat at the UN um, under the country's uh, name. And I was against it then, unless there had been some uh, conditionality and some uh, efforts by uh, the Taliban to moderate their uh, oppress oppressive tactics. I'm against that now, but on the other hand, people are starving. Uh, the healthcare system has been totally uh, destroyed. And there are very brave NGOs on the ground as we speak who are, are trying to help alleviate the suffering. So I think humanitarian support, although the Taliban seem to be little interested in that, but continuing to try to provide that and have governments like ours uh, supportive of that. But it's very important uh, to try to hold the Taliban to what they said when they were negotiating the agreement with uh, Trump and Pompeo when they said that they would let women go to school, that they were going to be more uh, open. And, of course, that was nothing but lies in order to uh, get uh, the United States and others uh, to withdraw troops. And, and then finally, I just noticed that now the Taliban are starting to impose restrictions on men. They're being told they have to wear uh, beards of a certain length. They're being told they can't wear Western clothes. And there was one poignant quote in an article uh, that I read about these latest uh, moves against men where a man is quoted as saying, I wish now I'd spoken up for the women. <laughs> and remember that because, you know, even in our own country right now, there are people who disregard the attacks on the press disregard the attacks on women, disregard the attacks on minorities, on LGBTQ rights, on people of different uh, religious persuasions, because that's not them. But there is no safe haven from authoritarians. They will go after you for any reason they choose because there is no rule of law for them. So take, take, a, take a lesson from what we're seeing elsewhere. Um. And yet that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan that we all watched, uh, some speculate, may have emboldened Vladimir Putin, uh, who is now uh, waging war on Ukraine uh, and has aspirations to reassemble the Soviet bloc. The Republican Party's posture has changed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia, which you write about in your uh, new book. Um, you, you mentioned Republic, Representative Mike McFaul 
the Republican chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, saying, quote, Russian propaganda has made its way into the United States and fortunately infected a good chunk of my party's base. Uh, Back in the day when William F. Buckley Jr. hosted Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush on the program, there was a very clear sense that Republicans were the party that was strong against the communists, that Republicans were the ones who would stand up to the Soviets. Uh, what has happened and what is your analysis? Is, is the GOP supporting forces that would reassemble the Soviet bloc? You know, Margaret, I would really like to understand completely why the Republican Party in, not, not everyone, to be fair, like Mike McFaul and others, um, have tried to warn against Russian propaganda influencing Republican lawmakers. But there's no doubt that there has been a kind of uh, dance between the Republican Party and Putin uh, for a number of years now that certainly uh, Trump took to the uh, extreme uh, point of talking about Putin, whom I've met and negotiated with uh, on several occasions, as though he were um, a, a mentor, uh, someone to be looked up to, someone to uh, actually model yourself after. Uh, and I think it has to do with a number of possible reasons for Trump. Money, follow the money whenever you see Trump doing or saying anything. Uh, I think that's uh, good advice for journalists in particular. Um, I think the ideology, a kind of white supremacy, uh, anti-gay, misogynistic uh, mentality that Putin has certainly uh, represented as he's consolidated power inside Russia. Um, and there is a, uh, an, I, I think it's a kind of yearning for a strong man government uh, that, uh, infect some of the Republican Party, but why other Republicans, including people I served with eight years in the Senate, whom I thought I knew, uh, have been uh, dragged into this uh, Trump-Putin, uh, uh, you know, bromance uh, is beyond me. Uh, it's dangerous for our country. Uh, our intelligence uh, agencies have been putting out alerts for the last week saying the Russians are back, they're back in strength, they're interfering in our election once again, they're more sophisticated than they were in 2016. Pay attention, don't get uh, fooled. He is our adversary. He has been focused on reconstituting Mother Russia, if not the complete Soviet Union, uh, for years now. He wants to undermine the West and in particularly has adopted a strategy of dividing uh, the United States against itself. Um, so I look at that and cannot for the life of me uh, understand completely what has gotten into uh, the Republicans, but uh, it's true and it's dangerous uh, and there's no, there is no way to predict uh, what might happen um, if uh, the election turns out one way. And, and you know, we know uh, that the promise has been made to pull the United States out of NATO. We know all of that. We, so and that's you, what we would have to be um, up against if it were to happen. And you do predict. I mean, you have a very clear chapter in your book about what happens in a second Trump administration. The New York Times reported this week that Trump's efforts to pressure federal agencies to investigate his enemies, including you, were much more exhaustive and successful than we had imagined. Uh, he has promised to be even more aggressive mm -hmm. in seeking retaliation against his enemies perceived and real, his political opponents uh, in a second term. Uh, you've noted that presidential historian Douglas Brinkley said that a second Trump term could, quote, bring about the end of our democracy and the birth of a new authoritarian order. It's hard to imagine our democracy transforming into authoritarianism. Is it actually existential? I think, I think it is existential, and I, I say that based on what he says and what Project 2025 uh, proposes as the agenda uh, for a second Trump May term. May I interject? You talk about this. Why do we always have a hard time believing what would-be authoritarians or opponents say they'll do? You know, Margaret, I think in this case, it started off because most Americans were introduced to Trump as a television star. 
a guy who played a successful businessman, not one who was a successful <laughs> businessman. And as the character that he played, um, and with the kind of macho uh, appearance of, you know, your fired and tough guy uh, in action, uh, people bought that, and, and people believed that. And people also discounted much of what he said, including members of the press, because they thought it was all a performance. You know, it was entertaining. You couldn't turn away from it. You have no idea what he was going to say next. And I think because people did not always, and still today, do not always take him seriously and literally, they are missing the larger picture because I don't think Trump believes anything except his own grandiose view of himself. And he has been played by everybody from Putin uh, to people in this country uh, who want to take advantage of him through flattery to get him to implement their agenda, whether it's huge tax cuts for the rich or whether it's you know, destroying the civil service or ending the Department of Education or overturning Roe v. Wade. All of that is just you know, a, a game uh, that he's the person in the middle of that others are manipulating. And, you know, there's no doubt that if he were to have power again without any kind of accountability and without people around him who stopped him from doing some very bad things um, in his first term, people who were Republicans, people in his administration, but who knew enough about government and cared enough about democracy uh, to put the brakes on. And they are begging us. I mean, they are like sounding three alarm fires. Do not vote for him. Don't let him near power again because they know if he is surrounded by sycophants and opportunists and manipulators, there's no telling uh, the damage that he will do. And I think it is hard. I think it's hard for people. I think it's hard for the press to really grasp the danger that uh, he poses. And as the article you referenced said, I mean, he, you know, he basically ordered his attorney general to reopen an investigation into me. Um, he ordered his two secretaries of state to reinvestigate me. They investigated the Clinton Foundation. You know, I'm the most investigated innocent person you have ever met in your <laughs> entire life. And so, but I will tell you, it is not a pleasant experience. You are forced to pay... What are the costs? Oh, it costs millions of dollars. It costs millions of dollars to defend yourself, to defend this wonderful foundation that has done so much good work. And I say in the book, you know, the, one of the leaders of the groups that judge foundation said, you know, if Hillary Clinton had run for uh, president, you know, the Clinton Foundation would be seen as one of the greatest philanthropies uh, in our country. But it was just hammered and, and innuendo and lies about it. And so, I think look, about ordinary I, people. I, I, we, you know, we are used to defending ourselves. It, it, you know, frankly, it gets old. Um, but a lot of people aren't. And, and, you know, the people that he would go after have a broad, broad cross-section that people in the press you know, people in academia, uh, people in government and politics, all kinds of people that are not paying homage to him and are, are interrupting or contradicting his narrative about him. And, you know, they're very, uh, you know, very ruthless. So I think it's uh, an important factor that people should be, uh, you know, taking into account when they look at this election. Brief final question. You liken yourself to Cassandra. <laughs> the Greek mythological figure who could see the future and the prophecies, but was never believed. Yeah. Uh, putting that Cassandra hat on for the moment, but we're listening. Uh, what is something you see happening in the near future that we should be taking more seriously? Well, I do think that um, the, the press needs a consistent, near, I mean, the, the press that's not supporting Trump blatantly, very uh, persistently. The press that's trying to be the press, be objective, be, you know, reporting the facts. Um, the press needs a consistent narrative about the danger that Trump poses. 
because you know people may still like, may still look at the danger and say I don't care it doesn't you know it doesn't affect me I'm going to vote for for X Y or Z but okay but at least people need to be woken up and given the facts about what he has done is saying and would do and I anticipate that you know something will happen in October as it always does um, you know the Russians um, as I said earlier are very active in this election. Um, we know the Iranians are active uh, as well. Chinese uses TikTok, or they certainly did against Biden and for Trump. I think they're a little less um, pro-Trump uh, right now. Um, so you look at where people get their information, and they get their information largely from social media. And so the campaign is doing the best job it can to combat that combat both domestic and foreign uh, false uh, disinformation. But I anticipate there will be a full court press in October. The, the digital airwaves will be filled. And why does that matter? Because the, the press that is pro-Trump anyway, oftentimes stories are put on digitally that then are picked up by, let's say, at Fox and others. And then those stories are stories, so the mainstream press reports on them, and so everybody then knows whether they picked it up digitally or picked it up from the pro-Trump media or it's reported on by everybody else, and, you know, that story then takes on a life of its own. There will be concerted efforts to distort and pervert Kamala Harris, who she is, what she stands for, what she's done. I mean, look, I mean, the, the crazy story about me running a child trafficking operation out of a basement of a pizzeria? <laughs> Don't laugh. Don't laugh. It was a huge story on not just social media platforms, but on Fox News. You know, and the way they reported it as well. We don't know if it's true or not, but it's been said. And it got one young man in North Carolina to get in his car with his, you know, assault rifle and drive up to liberate these non-existent children and shoot up a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. This is dangerous stuff. It starts online, often on the dark web. It migrates. It's picked up by the pro-Trump media. It's then reported on by everybody else, which makes sure it has about 100% coverage. And people believe it. So I don't know what it's going to be, but it will be something, and we'll have to work very, very hard to make sure that it is exposed uh, as uh, the lie that it is. Secretary Clinton, for your time today and for being with us, thank you very much. How about a round of applause for Secretary Clinton? Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, dear. Please welcome to the stage, Jean E. Borgo from Internews. Thank you, thank you, I know they're amazing. Thank you. Just 48 hours ago, I was in Kyiv, Ukraine, meeting Ukrainian journalists supported by my organization, Internews. We're not a news organization, but we're a nonprofit organization that supports independent news organizations in over 100 countries, focused mainly on countries and communities where such media struggles to exist. While the Ukrainian reporters I met, many from the East, from places such as Kharkiv, Kherson, and Donetsk, are covering their communities during war, they were not war correspondents. They're your local news team, thrust into a terrible situation and working at great peril. Many are facing trauma and extreme exhaustion after two and a half years covering a horrific conflict. They do this because they have firsthand understanding that during a war, news and information literally saves lives. They do this because they know their work is a vital tether between the community, the people experiencing the war firsthand, and the rest of us, the rest of humanity, who without them may never know the truth about what is happening on the ground. This tether is holding strong because of people like you. Last year, from this stage, we launched Internews' Emergency Fund, a $10 million commitment to deploy emergency resources at unprecedented speed to journalists and news organizations facing existential threat. At the start of the war, the brave Ukrainian journalists I met were the first to receive first aid kits and flak jackets. 
because of the fund. Radio stations distributing life-saving information to refugees on the front line of the civil war in Sudan are benefiting from the fund. And as soon as the Israel-Hamas conflict ends, we plan to deploy funds to help rebuild a devastated media sector. We couldn't be more grateful to the Clinton Global Initiative for bolstering the emergency fund in its early days, and we are really grateful to additional donor funders who have walked and stepped up and met the call of this fund, including the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Woodnex Foundation. Our emergency fund allows us to tackle the emergencies facing news organizations today, but at Internews, an equally important aim is to set up independent media for long-term resilience. As many in this room know, traditional media businesses simply aren't working, triggering fears of media extinction and that threatens the survival of news outlets everywhere. There's an, this is an urgent crisis for democracies and aspiring democracies around the world. Simply put, fact-based independent media that holds power to account is being outcompeted and undermined by new platforms and changing information environments. To confront this crisis, we at Internews needed to think big and at scale. The result is a new solution designed to enable thousands of struggling news organizations to make better data-driven decisions to build up their organizations operationally and ultimately to thrive. So today, I'm proud to announce our 2024 commitment to action, the Media Viability Accelerator, or MVA. The MVA is a free digital platform designed to enable independent news outlets to become financially sustainable by tracking, benchmarking, and optimizing their business performance. Basically, the MVA provides under-resourced news organizations around the world with the type of business intelligence normally only available to larger global media players. It's being developed in partnership with Microsoft, which has provided invaluable technical support, and with the U.S. Agency for International Development, which has supported this initiative since the start. This is a powerful coalition between corporate, nonprofit, and government sectors, led by Internews, but really working with a whole network of global and regional media support organizations, several of whom are in this room today. To get concrete, our 2024 CGI commitment to action, we pledge over the next two years to sign up 2,000 additional news organizations to use the MVA platform. We also to pledge to engage 20 more corporate and philanthropic partners to lend their support and expertise. As the success of these 2,000 news organizations is bolstered through the MVA, they will be able to employ or re-employ tens of thousands of journalists, reaching millions of people with critical news and information. Ultimately, the MVA aims to fight back the media extinction and ensure that news organizations, particularly vital local news organizations, remain in business and do what they do best, defend and uphold democracy by ensuring that everyone everywhere is informed, able to thoughtfully engage in their communities and hold power to account. We are so grateful to the Clinton Global Initiative for recognizing that a healthy press needs both security and sustainability. Security and sustainability are essential for news organizations and they're essential for realizing the promise of freedom of expression in a democracy. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Jonathan Monroe from BBC News. Good morning. Uh, what a pleasure and privilege it is to be here uh, today on behalf of the BBC, and in particular to the BBC's international non-profit, BBC Media Action. Right now, well, in about six or seven minutes' time in Kyiv, Ukrainian public broadcasting will go on air with their early evening peak time newscast. Media Action is ensuring that journalists there can report safely and remain on air by supporting the public service broadcasting sector in Ukraine. It's also helping radio stations in Afghanistan to ensure that women's views are heard, even as their rights and freedoms, as we heard earlier from Secretary Clinton, are being devastatingly curtailed. And it's providing a lifeline to the remote rural broadcasters who reach communities in South Sudan and Ethiopia, amongst many other places. More broadly, this is a critical time for journalism globally. Disinformation and misinformation are rising sharply, and that's having real-world consequences. Press freedom has fallen to a point where journalism is now either completely or partly blocked in around 75% of 
of the world. And journalists face harassment and intimidation on a daily basis. In this increasingly unstable world, the value of trusted journalism has never been greater. And I'm proud, therefore, that the BBC is the world's most trusted news provider. Our mission to pursue the truth brings independent and impartial news to an audience of around 450 million people every week. The biggest part of that is the BBC's World Service, operating in English and in 42 other languages. Like BBC Persian, serving the oppressed communities of Iran, BBC Russian, serving audiences with independent news across Russia, BBC Hausa, serving the lawless territories of northern Nigeria. There's an equally crucial role for local media, serving their own communities in some of the poorest and most fragile countries and provide that same trusted information to their audiences. And through BBC Media Action, we're able to bridge the gap that exists between the provision of international breaking news to global audiences and offering that last mile of support and protection to public interest media on the ground. Today, here at the Clinton Foundation Initiative, the BBC Media Action is launching its latest commitment, the pursuit of truth for inclusive, democratic societies. This is a groundbreaking new initiative devoted to accurate reporting through support for journalists and journalism, newsrooms, and healthy media ecosystems around the world. Specifically, BBC Media Action is pledging to mobilize $20 million working with donors and partners to fight disinformation. Media Action will offer direct financial support to frontline media, world-class journalism training, and support for young journalists to shape the next generation of trusted storytellers. We'll share innovations in journalism technology and tools, many of them pioneered by the BBC, including focus on the responsible use of AI. The pursuit of truth is our commitment to the global movement to support those who report without fear or favor for the benefit of everyone. But we can't do this alone. If you believe in the critical role of truly public service media in protecting development and democracy to achieve a freer and fairer world, join us. Join us in that crucial existential fight. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Jody Ginsburg from Committee to Protect Journalists. The Committee to Protect Journalists was founded in 1982 to help journalists report freely and safely. More than 40 years later, reporting on environmental issues has expanded well beyond the erstwhile safety of the science desk. Journalists probe political corruption and the organized crime networks exploiting natural resources. They report environmental devastation and the innovations and policies to stop it. As climate change and its effects intersect with every aspect of our lives, it's clear that everyone is a climate reporter now, and the crisis is urgent. This November, my organization will honor Kimi de Leon, a leading Guatemalan journalist and co-founder of a news agency focused on environmental and human rights issues. De Leon has experienced relentless threats from corporate and governmental forces determined to silence her reporting. She has been harassed on social media and threatened with criminal charges. Too many journalists face the same reality as Kimi. They provide the facts we all need to survive and they pay a heavy price, be it physical, emotional, legal or financial. That's why today the Committee to Protect Journalists is announcing a Clinton Global Initiative Commitment to Action to launch the Climate Crisis Journalist Protection Initiative, an ambitious $1 million initiative aimed at comprehensively protecting journalists from threats associated with work on climate change and the environment. We have already raised 30% of the funds but are looking for partners to join us in growing this work. 
The work will create a dedicated emergency assistance funding pool to provide direct financial and non-financial support and training. We'll detect global hotspots and safety trends, map journalists' needs, and conduct preventative outreach. And we will work with the private sector to ensure that journalists face no barriers or reprisals for reporting on their role in both driving, in both driving and curbing the climate crisis. During the 1980s, investigative journalists in Ethiopia circumvented restrictions and censorship imposed by the government to document a deepening famine that official statements denied altogether. As a result, millions of lives were saved. This is the power of a free press. Please join CPJ as we seek to protect journalists to prevent our latest crisis. Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage our moderator from PBS Firing Line, Margaret Hoover, and panelists Alsu Kumrashiva, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, Jonathan Monroe, BBC News, and Maria Reza, Rappler. <sighs> Maria Reza, Alsu Kumrashiva, Jonathan Monroe. Little live, live action on the front here. Um, don't be sorry, but this is a digital media age. <clears throat> I want to start by also disclosing to the audience that I am on the chair. I am on the board of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and also who has uh, just returned from Russia as a journalist recently freed from, is a journalist for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So, also. You are a dual U.S.-Russian national, and while you were visiting your sick mother in Russia last year, you were detained by Russian authorities, jailed, for supposedly foreign, failing to register as a foreign agent, and you were finally sentenced to charges six and a half years in prison. You were released alongside Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich and others in part of a prisoner swap. Uh, two weeks after your sentencing. The world watched on television as you embraced your children and your husband. Um, how are you adjusting to being back home? Margaret, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to share this stage and this event with you. Less than two months ago, I was in prison, and now I'm here, which... Uh, again, is a perfect example that we uh, need hope. Uh, I was always hopeful that my imprisonment would end sooner or later. I'm so happy it ended sooner than um, uh, things deteriorated and um, got worse. Um, I'm so happy to be back. I'm so happy to uh, advocate for my um, colleagues who are in prison now in um, Crimea and uh, Belarus. I'm so happy to be with my family, and my daughter Bibi is here with me, uh, my two daughters along uh, with my um, husband, Pavel Buturin, were champions in the advocacy uh, for me for, for, to release me. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to talk about what works here uh, and what needs to be done for safety uh, of journalists. Uh, the uh, safety, we, we rely on journalists. Uh, when I say we, I'm on the other side now. I'm, um, uh, are you, are you going to continue as a journalist? Um, it's a good question. Um, does a journalist uh, ever stop being a journalist? Tell me that. Uh, but I really believe in education. I believe in two things. Um, I believe in um, uh, educating uh, younger journalists and uh, younger generation of journalists. And uh, we can't whisper words of wisdom into their ears, uh, into our children's ears. We, they live by our example. They, we lead, uh, we lead uh, the example. That we are role models for them, and that's why uh, my my uh, daughter is here with me. And um, they've been um, such advocates for my release. Uh, they step up uh, immediately, and uh, I'm so proud of them. And um, the, the second thing I want to really emphasize uh, that. That really worked uh, uh, is solidarity and um, RFRL's advocacy team uh, built up a coalition of um, 
rights groups, freedom press groups, uh, lawyers, uh, government officials, everyone who could help and uh, put a personal and professional input on my release. So these two things really work, solidarity, coming together, and education. What kept, uh, how did they, how were you treated in Russian custody? Um, the irony of uh, the whole situation was that they kept me there because I was an American citizen. And they treated me as a Russian citizen and even worse. Other Russian prisoners got access to phone calls and visits from their families and I was denied that. I was denied uh, any basic um, basics in, in prison for more than uh, nine months. Uh, but um, as I said, I was hopeful. You know, um, 15 years ago, I was exactly early October uh, 2009, um, Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton visited Kazan, my native town where I grew up, I graduated, and I was imprisoned. It was 15 years ago. You were imprisoned in your hometown that Hillary Clinton visited 15 years ago. Absolutely. It was incredible. It, was, uh, it meant so much for the local community. It meant so much for RFERL journalists covering that visit. And uh, while the expert was speculating why she chose Kazan over other Russian cities, because it was such a short trip, it was a two-day trip, so it was Moscow and Kazan, uh, uh, the local community were very proud. And I could see, even like before coming here to, to New York, to this event, I, I looked through the photos. Uh, she visited uh, uh, the famous mosque in Kazan. She f visited the famous church. She, made, uh, she met the um, local community leaders, uh, the one I had interviewed before. And um, it was incredible. So uh, 15 years ago, it was different. Um, journalists were not imprisoned, um, parents had hope uh, for the future of their children, and now it's different, and imagine it's 15 years, and if we start doing now, and we start education, if we start securing um, the um, security of journalists, it might change too. So, so hope uh, kept me going in prison, and hope will keep us going. Um, what you've just described is a transformation in media freedom in your home country of Russia in the last 15 years. And Jonathan, I'm going to get to you on this because this is, this is one area where you're, you're, you're battling on the forefront. But to give it a global perspective, Maria, um, Secretary Clinton, uh, I asked, how, where is media freedom now in the context of the life that you have lived internationally and in public service? I ask you the same question, a Nobel Peace Prize winner who has won and been awarded this prize for your bravery with media freedom around the world, where do you see media freedom globally now? Is it the worst it has ever been in your lifetime? Absolutely. And let me quote a few things, right? OSCE just came out with a report in July that said 90% uh, correlation between media freedom and the quality of a democracy. And yet, so this is my 38th year as a journalist, we have never lived through anything like this where, and you haven't heard this enough here, uh, big tech, the distribution platform, what connects each of us. Does anyone here not have a cell phone? Uh, or is not on social media, right? This is by design set up against facts, against journalists. It literally um, manipulates your emotions. It hacks our biology. And what keeps you scrolling <laughs> are lies. This is an MIT 2018 study. I feel like we're saying this again, right? MIT 2018. Can't say it too much. Lies spread six times faster than facts. After Elon Musk bought Twitter and turned it to X, do you think it's better or worse? What's the worse. answer? Worse. How right? much worse? Um, there's several studies, so again, I won't go back because let's do it as a study. But the other part that no one has really talked about is since Elon Musk brought the basement down, brought it down lower, instead of the other big tech companies putting it, pulling him up so that the safeguards that were there in 2020 are in place, they followed him down. Mm. So Americans are going to vote this year of about half the world voting, we were going to vote with less facts, more disinformation, more hate, more fear, more anger, because that is what spreads fastest. Okay, so you start with that. It's funny to hear Secretary Clinton talk about it, but you know, 
what we learned in the Philippines when someone like Rodrigo Duterte says he is going to kill people and that he's dumped three bodies in Manila Bay, he actually means it. Mm -hmm. And when he became president, when he began to lie repeatedly, news organizations like us had to learn to say that's a lie and then to continuously add context mm -hmm. to every single instance. It goes against our training as journalists and that's the other part. Everything you know has been turned upside down. It's quicksand as a journalist. Let me ask you a question if, as a follow-up and Jonathan, I'm coming to you. Last time I saw you, uh, you were on book tour in the United States and many people, many people of authority were concerned that you were returning to the Philippines because they were persuaded, with very good reason, that you would face a 100-year jail sentence, you would spend the rest of your life in prison. You have now said that Duterte, under, I'm paraphrasing, under Duterte, life was like hell, and now under Marcos, you've moved to purgatory. Is that a silver lining? What happened? Oh my gosh. Thank God you're back. No, 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 no. You know, again, I still have two cases left. Every time I travel, I have to ask the Supreme, the Philippine Supreme Court for approval to travel. I cannot deviate from any of the hotels or flights. Um, so but was this a win from Western pressure on your government? What, to what do you attribute the, the shift from hell to purgatory? We now have a president, and this is the irony, the only son and namesake of our former dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, who was ousted in a people power revolt in 1986, right? He's now president. He became president in 2022 in May. He cares what the rest of the world thinks. He's educated in the West. He has to face China, as does the rest of the world, right? We've talked about Russia. We've talked about Gaza. We've talked about Sudan. China is that, and where is it? The, that break point is in the West Philippine Sea or what the rest of the world calls the South China Sea. But look, here's, here's the, it can get better, but here's what I saw happen in my country. History changed in front of our eyes to elect President Marcos. Those information operations to change the name Marcos from the kleptocrat who stole $10 billion in 1986, 2014, the same time Russia ceded the meta-narrative that it used to annex Crimea and then Putin used to actually invade Ukraine itself eight years later, in 2014, the meta-narrative that was ceded for Marcos was the greatest leader the Philippines has ever known. You know, Milan Kundera said, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Mm -hmm. Social media is not about one post alone. It's not about content. It's about saying a lie a million times mm -hmm. and making it a fact. So we watched our history change and we elected President Marcos and he did bring us to purgatory, so thank you. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you're the global news director of the BBC. You have journalists operating war zones, uh, dictatorships, authoritarian regimes around the world with media shri freedom shrinking. 71% of the globe now lives under authoritarian uh, rule. You are most concerned about Russia. Yes, we are most concerned about Russia. Um, uh, thank you for your hope, Maria. Um, it's sometimes quite challenging to have hope uh, when talking about the media in and around Russia. There'll be plenty of people in this room who will be on the same list as me, banned from Russia because we advocate free media. Um, our Russian service has had to be uh, sent to work in Latvia, uh, in a, a temporary newsroom in, uh, in the capital there, um, Riga. And that's because the Russians passed legislation a couple of years ago, just after the uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine, to make it illegal for us to report what the Russians describe as misinformation about their armed forces and their government. Now, that definition is in the eye of the beholder, in other words, Russian prosecutors. So having any sort of free media reporting in Russia, particularly if that media is getting to Russians, that is an impossible thing to do if you're operating in the country. But we still try. Um, we are operating a temporary newsroom which is pursuing investigative journalism. We track, for example, 
the number of known dead on the Ukrainian front line. That number just ticked over 70,000 Russian soldiers uh, known to have died on the front line. That number came up last week. And we reported that into Russia in Russian um, on platforms which the Russian population are hungry to hear from, to read, to see. But of course, it's all illegal. Yeah. Um, we do uh, maintain a small reporting presence in Russia, but they're reporting in English for the global audience, not principally for the Russian audience. So this is really worrying. Russia is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, so is China. And um, the advocacy of the outside world for the free media needs to be absolutely relentless in pursuing the case for free journalism, proper investigative reporting globally. And as you rightly say, those figures are going in the wrong direction, not the right direction. How, this is for each of you. What are the, if this is the most urgent threat, I think you all agree this is the most urgent threat. This is going the wrong direction, not the right direction, media freedom around the world. Um, what is the number one thing American audience, this is UN General Assembly Week. We have foreign leaders from around the world here this week. The, the purpose of this panel is to shed a China light and to, to re elevate this issue. Um, what is the number one thing, both here in the United States and abroad, that can be done? If you had one thing, each of you, to elevate this issue and to fix, and to really begin to fix, what would it be? I'll start with you, Anna. Also. I would say uh, nobody should take free access to free information and use for granted. People and leaders and uh, business leaders and managers, they should know that uh, it's a privilege of a free world. It's a, it's a precondition to be free, to have an access to free world. And um, people should know that uh, there are lots of millions of people uh, are deprived of free information and it brings uh, to disasters later. Uh, that, that's what I want to emphasize. There has to be a way of forging a coalition in the free world to enforce uh, the platforms on which misinformation spreads to take responsibility for the content that they publish. The idea that they're not publishers, which is a fine definition in law, is frankly nonsense. They are publishers, and they need to be held responsible by the global community, by countries like the US and the UK and the rest of the countries in the European Union where free media is a reality and is part of our democratic accountability. To operate in those countries, those platforms need to, to, to be told that responsibility rests with them for what's on their platforms, and there needs to be a financial penalty of significant magnitude if they breach that. You know, it sounds so much better with a British accent. Um, <laughs> but let me take that forward and, and move it, please. right? Um, social media and now generative AI, the technology that is ru ruining our lives, is running our lives, is not based on facts, none of it. I've had several deep fakes now. The first one was done by a Russian scam network. Explain it. A deep fake is generative AI um, created. It looks like you, sounds like you, but isn't you, right? You've seen some of these things already. My first one was soon after OpenAI rolled out ChatGPT, and I was, it came from Russia, we traced it. It was a Russian scam network, and I was selling crypto, right? I don't if sell only. crypto, right? <laughs> then, but I had CFOs and CTOs and CEOs calling me from the Philippines saying, tell us about this. Um, no, <laughs> so deep fake, you know, you know about the, the, the Hong Kong company where he was, the guy, the, the treasurer was on a call, a Zoom call with four different people and he, they told him to wire $25 million from Hong Kong to London. Um, every single one of the four on the Zoom call were deep fakes and they lost $25 million, right? So, so I think the first is, you know, definitely, um, these tech companies, and a lot of them are Amer they're American, Silicon Valley driven, um, and TikTok. It's funny that America took action against TikTok, but not against the, the original sins, right? Because this is part of the reason 71% of the world is electing illiberal leaders democratically is because they believe it. And yet you support the TikTok legislation? I support anything that holds the platforms accountable. Okay. 
right? I have been saying this, because that's the medium term. It's one, the reason why I spent more time in Brussels when they were deliberating the Digital Services Act. This is not a free speech issue. If you think it's a free speech issue, most of the time, that probably comes from a tech lobby. Yeah. Um, but the other part, so stop the behavior modification system, because again, Americans are going to vote with a much larger generation gap. Secretary Clinton talked about campus. We both now teach at Columbia University. And the four out of 10 Americans now get their information from social media. A statistical survey says that of 18 to 34 years old, 55% of them believe the political information on social media that they get. 55 and above, 51% disbelieve it. So where you get your information determines how you see the world, how you feel, and how you act, meaning how you vote, right? When will these tech companies take responsibility for that? So, so I, I believe in that. And then the other part is I'm tired of begging for facts of begging the big tech companies, who, by the way, are making $300 billion a year, a billion, 300 billion, not million, 1% to, to news organizations would help. But, you know, if they were to do that and restore facts, then we would stop being manipulated. Because guess what? It's not just, your, it's not just the people who want to make money here or who want power here. It's China, Iran, Russia, and the information warfare that Americans are being subjected to. And it is off the scale right now. So the last thing I would add is we need, news organizations in the global south need help in this time period, i.e. money. Where did the advertising go? BBC Media Action has given, you know, one way, but the other thing that we started that I, you know, have spent time, so much time on is the International Fund for Public Interest Media, where we went to democratic governments and said, you know, turn the ODA, Overseas Development Funds assistance, from 0.3% to 1%, and you will get a billion dollars a year to help this kind of hemorrhage right now. So what we did is in the last two years, we raised $53 million. By the end of this year, we'll be giving out $30 million on the sidelines of Unga in Wednesday. Sorry, my pitch. Um, we will start the investment climate. News organizations are not going to survive this. Women are not going to survive this, whether you're a journalist, an activist, or a leader, or a politician. We are under attack. Uh, it's, so, Jonathan, also perhaps you'll want to comment on this. You know, it sounds like what your, 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 your solution then is in the legislative bodies of Western nations to legislate or, or to form some kind of guardrails. I think that's right, but let's be clear. We believe in free speech. We're not trying to legislate away from free speech. Uh, quite the contrary. We believe in opinions. We believe in scrutiny. We believe in open access to media. But when you have a situation as we had in the UK this summer, where there are a significant right. number of riots around towns in England because of a false claim on one social media platform that um, it was a, a, an asylum seeker who had caused the death of some children when it was not, he was not an asylum seeker. X. Um, yeah. Uh, he uh, had no connection with the asylum process at all, but that triggered a significant amount of damage and injury across a significant number of communities. That is not free speech. That's just untrue. And so legislators need to work on how enforceable a new regime would be. And you know what? I think that the vast majority of people who consume social media would support that if it's done well, because nobody wants to be looking at their phone not knowing whether they can trust what they're reading or not. They might identify opinions they don't agree with, although most people follow people they do agree with, which is another problem with the sort of uh, echo chamber of um, social media. But this is becoming an urgent problem. This is no longer a problem that's 10 years away. This is a problem that's happening right now. Also, your <clears throat> the organization to which you belong, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, unlike broadcasting in, in Western democracies has a deep and rich tradition of broadcasting behind the Iron Curtain and even today broadcasts and operates in 23 countries in 27 languages, mostly in Central Asia and in places where there is decidedly shrinking media freedom. 
and it's dangerous. My colleagues are under danger constantly. Uh, we deliver uh, news and information uh, to the countries where people don't have access to news and information and in, uh, uh, independent news and information. And um, we journalists, we rely on institutions, on legislations uh, of the free world. Um, any detained journalist uh, should be uh, designated wrongfully detained immediately uh, by not only by the United States but all other um, uh, free countries. And um, an attack on any journalist in any country is a personal attack, professional attack on all of us. This is how um, uh, we consider it, uh, this is how we see it. And uh, when journalists are wrongfully detained, we rely uh, on free world to, to release uh, journalists and to help them later. I would be remiss not to mention that three of your colleagues are in prison now, two in Belarus, Andrei Kursnysik and Ilhar Losnik, and also in Russian-occupied Crimea, Vlad Yesipenko has been, in, has been in prison for multiple years. Um, what is your message to, to us in the free world? to your, your colleagues who are in prison, what can help them and how do we expedite their releases? I can share what helped me. Uh, I knew I had such a tremendous support and when I was released, I realized that I knew only 10% of that. And when I came back, uh, I, was, I was left speechless at the scale of the campaign. We can continue doing so for my colleagues too, and um, they will get that information. One way or another, they will know that we support them, that we remember about them, and we are trying our best to help them to be free. Can I just add that, that, that I think um, Maria is totally right about designating the arrest of journalists in that way. It's also families. In, in the case, for example, of the Iranian um, authorities who persecute the families of people working on Persian language media, including BBC Persian. Uh, BBC Persian operates out of London because there's no, simply no way of doing it in Iran. But their families, their extended families, are routinely interrogated by the police and security forces in Iran. It's an outrage. And despite um, significant lobbying, literally no improvement has been seen in that situation. So the designation can't be limited to people who happen to carry a nice badge saying they're a journalist. It's the whole community that supports journalism. And to add to that one, you know, uh, I am lucky compared to a lot of our other colleagues who are in prison, but, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, RSF, Reporters Without Borders, and ICFJ, the International Center for Journalists, actually created this coalition. Mm -hmm. They called it the Hold the Line Coalition because there are so many sacrifices you have to make to hold the line. Brought in 84 different media freedom groups, and you guys were part of it. You know, this helped. I don't know if I would be here in front of you if we didn't have that kind of help. And it is both before you go to jail, yeah. during, and then I think the other part, we were talking about this backstage, right? So your anger, suppressed anger comes out after the crisis. Yeah. I think even after. I was so, um surprised uh, to hear the same thing from, from Maria. Um, I controlled my feelings uh, and emotions when I was in prison uh, because um, I, I wouldn't have helped myself to there. Uh, and um, I felt no anger, I felt no uh, desperation. I, I was just hopeful or I was falling apart. Uh, and, uh, but when I came back, I, I have all this spectrum of emotions right now. There is anger, but it's, uh, uh, I want to do something, and um, I'm emotional. Every time I see someone, I want to hug, and Margaret, we, we, we gave each other so many hugs backstage. Uh, uh, all spectrum of good and bad emotions, but uh, I will make them work now. Um, the United States was slow to designate you, uh, to give you the designation. Uh, that you deserved as, as being, uh, I'm sorry, remind me the name of the, it's just a scheme of mind, the designation of uh, a wrongfully, wrongfully detained. detained. Um, you received that designation finally when you were on the plane coming home uh, with Evan Gersonovic. You know, that designation helps, even still. Oh, yeah, it helped. Uh, however, um, what do we need to do in the United States to support journalists who are imprisoned? and to support media freedom abroad? 
uh, to keep our stories uh, in the spotlight, uh, to build um, solidarity and um, cooperation between journalists. You know, we journalists, uh, uh, journalism and media community, we are competitive and we have to be. But when it comes to safety, we have to unite and uh, show solidarity. This was my case. Uh, this was Evan Gershkovich's case. And um, I believe this will be the case uh, when it comes to other journalists. Uh, it doesn't matter what media outlet they're from, uh, which country they're from, we have to be united. I think what's at stake is does the international system of rule of law still work, mm. right? And I mean that both in the wars that are being fought right now and on, on big tech. There's a great book coming out now by Marichka Shock. It's called The Tech Coup, mm. right? Impunity is happening online. You get away with lying. You get away with manipulation. You get away with annexing Crimea, with attacking Ukraine, with attacking Gaza, right? So where, do, where is Is that really the same though? Attacking Gaza and attacking Ukraine? I would say impunity, and I would actually go as far as comparing the lawlessness of Putin and Netanyahu. Strong men, absolutely, who are actually uh, like, like for, uh, former President Trump, former President Duterte you know, looks up to these types of men. You pull this in. Do we have a system of rule of law? I will just say there were people who will quibble that the freely elected leader of Israel versus the wrongfully and not freely elected leader of Russia might not be apples to apples. Absence and death and journalists. Uh, 75, more than 75%, to quote a CPJ, um, more than 75% of the journalists killed last year were killed in Gaza. Um, that, that is, that is, well, that is, that has been reported. Um, final thoughts from each of you. Uh, and Maria, I'd like to tee you up because you have um, an insight about influencers and journalists and the role they play on social media and how little the public knows or can, can, can discern between the two. Yeah, I think, you know, I said this in the, in the main hall. Um, the corruption that plays out as autocracy or kleptocracy globally right now starts with our information ecosystem. I became a journalist because information is power. That power is being turned against the cellular level of every democracy, which is the citizens. So the final words here is, let's not keep staying downstream where we deal with what has happened because we allowed the upstream, right? So, and again, I'll go big tech. I mean, if you look at the actions of both big tech and the dictator's playbook in the real world, they're very similar. Um, spoken by somebody who's in a recovering per hell to purgatory, right? So, so stop the factory of lies. When you stop the factory of lies, you stop the manipulation of people, you stop the insidious manipulation, so that cognitive biases don't polarize. Polarization, you know from our chat, mm -hmm. is a friends of friends algorithm of every single social media platform. Mm -hmm. You are being allowed to be experimented on in real time with technology that, and that you talk even go to the foundational models, generative AI. Journalists, we go there. We risk our lives. We risk our safety. But the incentive structure is upside down. So please be aware. And we got to do more. We have to move away from the virtual world into the physical world and demand better. Let me just tee this up um, for you, Jonathan. There's um, a famous, uh, this is a Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty quote, but there's a famous old Radio Free Liberty, Radio Liberty interview with James Buckley when he was on fire, the original firing line with William F. Buckley. Uh, he said that the point of journalism and the point of journalists, right, is that we're operating with the assumption that human beings are entitled to facts and that it's up to the individuals in those countries of what they will do with those facts. Yeah, the, the facts, there's no such thing as alternative facts, facts are facts. Um, but as Alice said earlier, and I, I think it's really important that we hold on to this, there is hope, right? We, we work in an industry, a trade, which is crucial 
to the DNA of the wider world. And facts are part of that. The distribution of facts, the challenging of things that are not factual, the labeling of things that are uh, deliberately put out there despite the fact that they're not true, that is very important. We've also got to hold our nerve. We've got to be willing keen, eager to scrutinize, to call people to account, to make ourselves unpopular with governments and authorities around the world, and in the words of George Orwell, to capitalize on the liberty we've got by telling people things they don't want to hear. If we, if we push, pull back from that mission, we will be failing ourselves. So however hard that is, however difficult and challenging that can be, even when there are real personal threats, organizations like the BBC and others who are represented in this room and on this stage, we are there to support that. And putting facts into the bloodstream is central to what we do. Uh, also, I'm going to quote Maria to you. One of the things Maria often says is, um, paraphrasing, you don't know who you are until you find that you have to fight for it. Um, well, our fight is every day. It's every day, it's every social media feed, it's 24 seven, it's on every time zone on earth, and we've gotta be up for that. Also, for you, uh, you're gonna focus on education now. Um, Tell us what you're gonna do next. It will be journalism too. Uh, they can't go uh, separately, they will go together. And um, I started with hope and I will end with hope. Uh, we are very hopeful uh, to have professional journalists around us uh, who do professional fact-based, fact-checked uh, job, and that's very crucial. That's important for the free world. Also, Jonathan, Maria Ressa, thank you for being here. Thank you for standing for Media Freedom, and thank you all for joining us.